Kinabatangan, one of the wildest river systems on the planet. Flowing through magical landscapes from steamy jungle highlands, through otherworldly floodplains, to its ultimate destination, the vibrant Sulu Sea. Along its course, the astonishing is commonplace. This is home to the exquisite, the bizarre, and the rare. A land in which ancient cultures coexist with prehistoric predators. Where new species are discovered almost daily. This is a wild frontier that is changing fast. The fate of this mighty waterway hangs in the balance and those who champion its cause are striving to preserve all that is unique about the Amazon of the East. Flowing through the northeastern tip of Borneo and stretching 560 kilometers from source to sea, the Kinabatangan River is the lifeblood of Sabah, the land below the winds. Our story begins, as does the river itself, in the misty heart of Sabah's highland rainforests, a realm dominated by giants and home to those uniquely adapted to live in their shadows and in their branches. Here, traditional people are balanced precariously between old and new worlds. The fragile equilibriums of this wild frontier are threatened by turbulent times. At the spectacular Imbak Falls, the life-giving Kinabatangan River is born. said Prudente is about to embark on the quest of a lifetime. In a never before attempted voyage, said is planning to photographically document the varied web of life that depends upon the Kinabatangan River from source to sea. I'm an Imba Kenyan, the upper reach of Kinabatangan. This is where I start my journey. I've been photographing wildlife along the Kinabatangan River for about 20 years. As a wildlife photographer, it doesn't get much better than this. The variety of wildlife found here is truly remarkable. Getting the right moment, it is inspiring. But said is driven by more than just a passion for imagery. He's on a personal quest to highlight the challenges facing this unique river system. One with which he shares an intimate connection. The Kinabatan River is a corridor of life, but the life it supports is under threat. Human encroachment, pollution, overexploitation are threatening the natural world here by documenting the varied and unique life along the river, I hope to show the world why it should be protected. This is not a journey said can do alone. To enlist the help of an old friend, he's heading downstream to the nearby village of Imbak. A number of distinct indigenous tribes known in Borneo as the Orang Sungai, meaning people of the river, depend on the Kinabatangan for their way of life. The 
remote village of Imbak is the westernmost township along the Kinabatangan River. It is home to members of an ethnic group known as the Dusun. For hundreds of years, the Dusun have traveled along the course of the river, fishing and trading, hunting and gathering. Even along the wildest river in the world, they have a particularly fearsome reputation. Historically, the Dusun were notorious as headhunters. Although the practice died out in the late 1800s, interestingly, there was a brief resurgence in the 1940s. During the Second World War, the atrocities committed by the Imperial Japanese Army permeated throughout the Pacific region. Borneo was no exception. But the Dusun were ready to exact their revenge. In 1945, when it became clear that the Allies would retake Borneo, many Japanese soldiers fled into the dense jungle where they fought on with suicidal determination, taking a heavy toll on advancing Allied forces. To combat these guerrilla tactics, the British posted a bounty on Japanese heads. And the Dusun rose to the challenge, emerging with their trophies from the jungle to be paid per head by an astonished Allied contingent. The practice itself has long since died out, but many traditions remain in the background of daily life. Logging and agriculture are now the primary industries in the area, employing the majority of villagers. The modern world has come to Imbak. Of course, with it comes change. While the arrival of roads, of power, of industry has generated new forms of income for local villagers like Mislan, the impact upon his traditional ways is keenly felt. Ada kurang sedikit kami sudah memuruh sebab kami ada kebun sawit sudah kan masih luas luas itulah tambahan kehidupan kami. While supermarket goods are available in village stores, many are beyond Miss Land's means. So, as with his forebears, he relies upon his surroundings for sustenance. Pendapatan yang lain di sungai lah memancing dan di kebun lah pergi kebun. Traditional hunter-gathering is also practiced to supplement family larders. And because men like Miss Lan and his uncle Senari, a village elder, think it is important to balance the benefits of the modern world with the richness of their culture. Medicinal plants are harder to find than edible ones, but they are there for those who know where to look. Kalau dulu ramai batu-batu di hutan ini, tapi pembelakan untuk bikin ini kelapa sawit kan, tanam kelapa sawit, berkurangan lah punya batu-batu. For centuries, the animals and plants of the surrounding jungle provided all that the Dusun ever needed. The secrets of these riverine forests are deeply rooted in their culture. Senari takes the opportunity to pass on ancestral knowledge before this too disappears. Ini kan obat ini daun kukuk dan kan. Jadi cara-cara mengenal dia, dia licin lah. Dan dia ada lembut sedikit lah kan. Dan dia punya sebelah sini putih. Dia punya belakang kan. Ini untuk budak-budak punya. Kasih turun panas lah. Dia demam kan. Kegunaan dia. One day, Miss Lan will need to pass this knowledge on to his children. Now, he must use the tracking skills that he learned when he was a child. It's time to hunt. 
uh, sebabnya kami memburu di hutan sebab kami tidak mampu lah untuk membeli di luar yang dijual daripada bandar ini lembu ke ayam banyak laluan kijang kilanduk bagus kita buat pirangkap sini nih These intricate trapping techniques have been passed down through generations, and both men are keen for these traditions to be kept alive. Perangkap ini memang penting. Daripada zaman sekarang ini yang mudah buat belajar lah supaya tradisi perangkap ini tidak hilang lah sampai akhir zaman. Once the snare has been set, patience is the name of the game. It may take two or three days before an animal springs the trap. Rosa. These highland rainforests have seen the evolutionary rise of a number of unique species, not the least one of the tallest and most endangered rainforest trees in the world, the dipterocarps. Perhaps nothing illustrates the fecundity of the place so well as this tree. It has been recorded that on one single dipterocarp tree, up to 1,000 different species of insect can live and thrive. But there is another emergent tree in the forest that dwarfs even these towering giants. Mislan and Senari seek out one such tree, a tree that their family has visited for generations, the mighty Mengaris. It towers more than 80 meters above the forest floor. And when conditions are just right, it too attracts insects, honeybees. Pan tahun diambil dia ada dia ada musim saja itu. Kalau kayu ini dia kuat bunga, ada dia punya masa kuat bunga, dia pun ada juga itu madu. Kalau tiada, dia pun dua tiga tahun memang tiada itu. Honeybees often choose to colonize Mangaris trees because their slippery trunks and high branching canopies afford protection for the hive from would-be predators. But Mangaris only flower every few years, so the rare presence of a hive is both fortuitous and short-lived. Mislan and Senari are in luck. Wild honey is a valuable commodity in the village, but gathering honey in the wild is fraught with danger. Not only is the hive 40 meters overhead, but if the bees attack in a swarm, the results could be fatal. Using the remaining daylight, Mislan and Senari quickly prepare a series of ladder rungs which the younger man will use to climb the tree. They're waiting for it to get dark when the worker bees become less active. Any light source, even moonlight, could precipitate an attack. Kalau lebat menyerang, terpaksa kami turunlah tahan sambil turun pelan-pelan sampai tanah. As night falls, Miss Lan nails the rungs into the tree, securing them carefully with twine and climbing as he goes. 
It's tricky work, and there are no safety nets. While Sonari sets a fire below the tree to draw any angry bees away from Missland, his nephew arms himself with a burning brazier to clear the hive. As the sparks fall to the ground, the awakened and enraged bees take off in pursuit of the embers. Mislan has to work fast. His efforts meet with success. He returns safely with a bucket full of prized honeycomb. Semasa saya di atas, ada yang gigit cuma saya turun ikut tangga itu adalah ada dua dua lah yang gigit. The pain is well worth it. Back in the village, the honey will fetch fifty dollars a litre. Sadly, as this forest continues to dwindle, Miss Lan and Sonari are unsure whether the tree that their family has relied upon for generations will survive to see another season. Life here is changing. In the face of rapid development, the cultural values and traditional ways of life of these proud Dusan people are being challenged. But while their future is unclear, Mislan and Sonari are determined to preserve precious elements of their cultural heritage. It's a determination shared by photographer Sed Prudente. All too aware of the changing face of the region, Sed has made his way to Imbak village and has met up with old friend and Orang Sungai river guide, Rizal. Hailing from downstream, Sed. Rizal has lived his life by and on the Kinabatangan. His keen eye and intimate knowledge of this mighty waterway will be invaluable as he joins Sed's quest to reveal the extraordinary abundance of life that depends on this, the wildest of rivers. The island of Borneo makes up a mere 1% of the global land mass, and yet it supports 6% of the world's biodiversity. A thriving hotbed of evolution, its capacity to nurture life is matched only by the mighty Amazon River Basin of South America. Borneo's isolation has created unique selective pressures, and just as importantly, the island sits at the epicenter of the monsoon region. Situated between the continents of Asia and Australia, it is drenched by monsoon rains not once, but twice a year. And it is the unique species that have adapted to life amongst these ancient giants that have drawn Sed and Rizal to these island forests. Sed, Kologo. There's a Kologo, a flying lemur. It's now resting. Well camouflage on the tree trunk. This is one of the largest glider in the world. They're one of the fascinating, weird creatures of our forest. Usually nocturnal, with saucer-like eyes for seeing in the dark, colugos are mammals uniquely adapted for flight. Thanks to a membrane of skin that stretches from limb tip to limb tip, making a perfectly rectangular aerofoil, colugos can glide 70 meters. The Kalugo is difficult to find. Getting a shot of it gliding is, must be in the book. Mm -hmm. 
Merced and Rizal are fortunate to have trekked their way to the right place at the right time. Yes, I got one shot. I just need one shot. Before they return to their boat, Rizal's instincts tell him that another intriguing species might be resident in the area. It's a Draco lizard. Just 20 centimeters in length, the Draco spends the majority of its life high in the treetops. This male extends a bright yellow dewlap, a flap of skin under its chin. He's advertising for a mate. As a photographer, what I'm looking for the Draco, one is the neck flap, when the male flapping its neck to attract female. Like many other species of lizard, the Draco is an adept climber. But one truly remarkable adaptation sets it apart from all others. It can fly. It can spread out folds of skin attached to its movable ribs to form wings, allowing it to glide for up to eight meters. When they glide, they have that beautiful membrane backlit from the sun. That's the shot I would like to have. That's the one. Nicely backlit, gliding. You can see the membrane. And one for the book. Having documented some of the unique species to be found amongst the towering dipterocarp trees, Sed and Rizal return to the river to continue their downstream journey. As the Kinabatangan descends from the highlands, the topography and vegetation begin to change. The towering dipterocarp trees give way to lower fruit-bearing canopies, and it is here, in the foothills, that larger mammals begin to appear. The Bornean pygmy elephant has only recently been confirmed as a distinct species of elephant. The knowledge that it is distinct greatly increases its importance. Primarily located along the Kinabatangan River, less than 1,500 of the species survive in Borneo, making it the world's most endangered elephant. The pygmy tusker depends on the river for hydration and food, feasting on the tall grasses that line the banks. The mineral salts found within the silt are also important. A mineral bath removes parasites and nourishes the skin. Although accustomed to their presence along the river, Sed remains in awe of these majestic animals and is always keen to capture a new image. The elephants in the Kiribatangan migrate up and down the river. So they reaches for, from the coastline of Kinabatanga right up the upper stream of Imba Canyon. The river is their life, just like the people. They're part and parcel of this whole ecosystem. The loss of habitat is the main threat. Without the habitat, we will lose the species. As with the people in the area, the coming of the modern world is having a marked impact upon the elephant's lifestyle. 
In the name of development, the jungles of Borneo are being cleared at an unprecedented rate. The island has already lost 50% of its rainforest. What remains is becoming increasingly patchy. The phenomenon, known as forest fragmentation, is one of the greatest threats to biodiversity in Borneo. One effect of fragmentation is that it forces elephants to cross developed land in order to reach other forested areas. It forces them close to the villages. And this brings the Bornean pygmy elephant into conflict with the local people and plantation workers. To protect their crops, villagers try to scare the elephants away, confronting them with burning tires and deafening sound waves produced by homemade cannon fire. It is a dangerous conflict that each year injures and kills both elephants and humans. To meet the challenge, the Regional Wildlife Department has established the Wildlife Rescue Unit, a specialised team made up of rangers and veterinarians which manages an elephant sanctuary to care for elephants caught up in the conflict. For Wildlife Rescue Unit Senior Ranger JB, looking after wild elephants is a lifelong vocation. Untuk saya, gajah uh, salah satu daripada hewan ataupun binatang yang uh, cukup istimewa ataupun spesial. Dan itu sebab uh, saya sudah lebih 30 tahun untuk uh, penia bertugas dengan gajah. Dalam kita punya tugas uh, wildlife rescue unit, di mana kalau uh, berlaku kes-kes yang serius, tugas kita adalah untuk uh, menyelesaikan masalah ini, yaitu dengan tangkap dan pindah gajah itu satu kawasan yang lain supaya tidak mengganggu kawasan kampung tersebut ataupun di ladang-ladang. Elephants are highly intelligent creatures and quick to learn. Rapidly deciphering scare tactics employed by farmers as relatively harmless, the elephants occasionally respond aggressively. In these situations, conflict easily escalates. Masa pagi di kampung Gambaran, suami istri mau jalan pergi kerja, kemudian jumpa dengan gajah ini lah, di mana kemalangan berlaku. Gajah ini langgar dengan istri dia, Kemudian uh, dia punya laki, kemudian gajah lari. Nasib baik, uh, cuma keadaan kulit ini uh, terkupas, uh, tidak ada yang patah. Uh, sekitar kampung merasa jadi uh, trauma. For the safety of all, the bull was transferred to the sanctuary. Satu hal. Kalau kita biarkan gajah terus masuk ke kawasan ladang, kadang-kadang orang tembak bunuh dan uh, kampung pun. Uh... While JB is tasked with smoothing over conflict between villagers and elephants, Good boy. it is wildlife veterinarian Dr. Laura's job to tend to any animal caught up in the fray. Before. I went to the sanctuary, I never met an elephant before. That day, when I see elephant, I know this is a majestic animal. So I was like, this is something that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. This is Priya, a five-year-old baby pygmy elephant and Dr. Laura's latest charge. Accidentally caught in a snare intended for smaller game, Priya received a nasty laceration to his ankle. Left unattended, infection would quickly have claimed Priya's life. 
With the aim of repatriating the young bull back to the forest, Dr. Laura is charged with nursing Priya back to health. It's the beginning of a lifelong relationship. Uh, usually the Borean elephant, they will live up to 50 to 60 years old in the wild. So at the age of five, they might bump into each other again in the future. Yeah, we never know. <laughs> but, but I hopefully know. <laughs> The Wildlife Rescue Unit receives a call from a nearby village. A herd of elephants has destroyed a harvest of crops and JB assembles a team to investigate. Ini gajah-gajah ini datang di, di kawasan kami di kampung kemarin ini kan. Uh, memang kami di sini macam rasa apa wah macam ketakutan lah. Although called pygmy elephants, they are quite large enough and more than capable of injuring or even killing a human if confronted. Tengok uh, dekat dengan perumahan di sini. Ini uh, amat berbahaya kepada penduduk di sini dan boleh mengancam nyawa. Uh, macam kami, uh, macam saya ini tidak ada pekerjaan lain hanya dengan bahan tanaman-tanaman yang kami tanam dan itulah sumber uh, apa ini sumber makanan kami lah dan pendapatan kami akan kupak kulit nih dan makan dirinya ini uh, pokok dan juga umbut kelapa ini yang bagus. Sebab ini salah satu daripada kegemaran gajah, makanan gajah yang paling dia gemar, yang tidak ada dalam hutan. Frustrating as it is to lose food and income, the farmers understand that the elephants are hungry because their natural food sources are being depleted. It is now up to JB and his team to track the herd and neutralize the danger before an elephant or a person gets hurt. Uh, kumpulan gajah ini biasa dia akan uh, keluar uh, setelah petang di kawasan berdekatan dengan hutan dan lama-kelamaan dia akan masuk ke kawasan uh, kawasan kampung ini pada lewat malam. Okay, I think this is uh, the new track. Iya. Yeah. Clear signs that the elephants are in the area, but alongside the elephant tracks, JB makes a disturbing discovery. Okay, ini merupakan uh, tapak anjing lebih kurang dalam enam ekor. Dan biasanya anjing uh, bila datang ke kawasan hutan hutan Jepun ni, dia akan uh, memburu seperti babi ataupun kadang-kadang uh, apa ini ya uh, lawan dengan gajah. It's an unexpected problem, and one that makes the team's task all the more dangerous. The feral dogs have chased the elephants deep into the forest, and it is unlikely they will come back to the road. But JB and his crew get lucky. Seizing the chance encounter, the team prepares its equipment. They must hurry before the herd moves further into the jungle. The plan is to tranquilize the dominant male with a dart so they can capture him safely. After fitting him with a satellite tracking collar, the team will relocate the bull to a forest reserve away from the villages. The rest of the herd will usually follow wherever the dominant male goes. This is the jantan besar dan uh, kalau ada jantan maksudnya kita mesti harus jauh sebab ini ada merbahaya sedikit uh, sebab gajah jantan ini lebih agresif although it will soon be dark the team has no choice but to make its move conscious of the potential side effects of the tranquilizer 
JB uses the minimum dose required to sedate the bull. It can take anything up to half an hour for the short-lived drug to take effect, so the team needs to stay close. Sunset further complicates the task. It's very difficult to track the elephant that we dotted at night, especially if we are not familiar with the terrain. Especially when other members of the group try to protect this particular elephant that already dotted. And there are other hazards lurking in the dark. <laughs> oh, baba baba. Oh, patutlah ada gonggong anjing sudah di seberang sungai. Hmm. Okay, okay, baba baba. There is a danger that the wild dogs could cause the elephants to rampage, trapping the team between the angry herd and the river. Assessing the new threat, JB makes the decision to press on. They catch up with the bull as the tranquilizer takes effect. They are now locked in a race against the clock. So after the elephant sleep, we chain all four limbs to make sure that he's fully secured. But as JB prepares to put the satellite tracking collar on, he gets a nasty shock. Okay. The dose has not been sufficient to properly tranquilize the bull. Oh, because the elephant is already awake, so nothing much we can do. We cannot do measurements, we cannot do the coloring. Anything else we want to do, maybe we wait for another day, not tonight. Yeah. To be on the safe side, Dr. Laura decides to reverse the effects of the sedative with an antidote. The team must now take care of the elephant for 48 hours after which it will be safe to tranquilize him again and put on the collar. This satellite collar, when fixed on the elephant, will give us exact point where the elephant are, and this information can be used to study their home range and also the movement of the elephant's herd. This time, the tranquilizer takes full effect allowing the team to safely carry out tests and measurements. But Dr. Laura makes a quite shocking discovery. It's a large marble that has been used as a projectile shot from a homemade gun. With his wounds tended and measurements completed, the bull can be woken up for the last part of his journey. By doing the translocation, we're not only going to protect the people in the village, but also protect the elephant group. When it comes to protecting these endangered elephants, Dr. Laura's views are very clear. They play a very important role in maintaining our ecosystem, and we are damaging the habitat, so who else? should be responsible to take care of them other than the human race itself. In the nearby forest reserve, the bull is finally out of danger. The rest of his herd will follow him out of harm's way for the moment. But on an ever dwindling forest frontier, it is a small victory for the wildlife rescue unit, the critically endangered Bornean pygmy elephant and the local villagers. As the sun sets, many species are drawn to the river to drink, roost, and hunt. The coming of the darkness also sees a changing of the guard. 
nocturnal animals emerge to commence their activities. But before the night can take a grip, there is that half-world between light and dark. And here too, the Kinabatangan River has its extraordinary species, if you can find them. Very little is known about the Sundra clouded leopard, named for the large cloud-like spots on its body. The impact of logging has led to this predator being classed as vulnerable, and as such, it is rarely seen in the wild. This rare footage of the clouded leopard illustrates an ongoing battle between this elusive predator and proboscis monkeys that has occurred along the banks of the Kinabatangan for generations. As adept as this leopard is in the canopy, there is always someone better. Tonight, you'll have to look elsewhere for a meal. Also tonight, the hunter has become the hunted. Said Prudente is seeking out this elusive predator, an animal that has really captured his imagination. The bone and clouded leopard is elusive. They're very charismatic. They're one of the largest cats in Borneo, and it's highly threatened. I've got three photographs of different individuals in the past 20 years, so it's pretty tough to get a photo of them. As difficult as getting a shot may be, said is motivated by more than artistic considerations. He sees it as the most seductive image one that will win people over to the cause of the Kinabatanga. It is important to get a photograph of Borneo and colored leopard in this book. They could be a pinup species of conservation in Borneo. Now cloaked in darkness, floating along the river becomes another worldly experience. But Sed and Rizal are well versed in navigating these dark waters what we're doing now is really cruising, hoping to see their eye shine. The eye shine is one of the indicators that nocturnal animals are alive, they're active. So once we see that eye shine, we'll stop and take some photos. The best thing about shooting at night is you see animals that you don't normally see at daytime. Once the sun sets, it's a different world. Okay, so much just there. Okay, let's find some cats. Yes, let's go. His quarry eluding him, Sed decides to try his luck along the banks of the river. It's not a decision taken lightly. The jungle is dangerous enough by day, but trekking through it at night is even riskier. Along with large carnivorous predators, there are all kinds of creepy crawlies to worry about. Snake, snake, snake. It's a python. Take a little python. Wow. Look at that. Yeah, it's moving. This is a reticulated python. He's probably looking for prey, squirrels, sleeping birds. Growing up to 11 meters in length, 
The reticulated python is the world's longest snake, besting even the notorious anaconda of Amazon fame. Capable of devouring an adult bearded pig whole, it is one of the few snakes reputed to have preyed on humans. Deeper into the jungle they travel, the more dangerous the creepy crawlies become. You see the Scutigera? It's a family of centipede, it's poisonous, and it's tons for small spiders and insects. Administering potent venom through modified legs, these formidable nocturnal ambush predators are capable of simultaneously subduing multiple prey. When Sed and Rizal finally do find a large predator, it has eight legs, not four. They happen across a giant orb spider at the precise moment an unwitting moth becomes ensnared within its huge web. What a moment. The right place at the right time. Spider just grab a moth. And it's happening in front of my eyes. That's the shot. Cloaked in darkness, the jungle is unwilling to give up any further mysteries. Said and Rizal decide to call it a night and return to their boat. But they have not been long on the water when Said's attention is drawn to something on the river bank. <laughs> Sitting on something, I'm not sure. There is a large spotted cat in the trees. It's quite tough to get some shot. Okay. I'm just gonna wait until you move to an open space. Still there, still there. Wait till you walk. It's a civet cat, a shy carnivore native to the area. Tonight, the darkness held on to its secrets. Said and Rizal meet the dawn without the coveted shot of a clouded leopard, but disappointing as that is, it's a big jungle. And elusive as they are, clouded leopards are known to roam over the entire region. It's time to leave the mountains of the upper Kinabatangan and head down towards the lowland floodplains. Along its course towards the Sulu Sea, the mighty river snakes through forests that hide orangutans and hornbills. It passes caves that could hold secrets of value to medical science. And it flows through the domain of a creature both fearsome and gentle, the rare and vulnerable Bornean sun bear. This is a journey only possible along the Amazon of the East. Thank you.